Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Gracious Heavenly Father, I just come into your presence by means of our Lord Jesus Christ and in his finished work. And by means of the Lord Jesus Christ, I ask that you would take and filter out all foolishness and ignorance, all that which is not true, but just seal to our hearts that which is truth. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I decided to break away from the typical verse-by-verse -verse study that we've been doing in Romans to insert a video into this series. It'll still be part whatever, which is a feeble attempt on my part due to much confusion to help bring some clarity to the biblical doctrine of divine election. Now, many of you will click off right here from the start. The, the doctrine of predestination and election is not a new thing that began with Calvin. Oh, Steve, you're a Calvinist, which has since, since then gradually lost favor with the passing of the years until today, where it's, it's believed by only a few. There's just a few of us crazy Calvinists and understood by even fewer and you know, I, I do not like the word Calvinism. What I hope to prove before we go any further into the subject that, uh, of our present study, that election, I wanna show how election is actually synonymous with the gospel of salvation by grace. That in fact, it is the gospel that contained within the revelation of the gospel in which we read, we're all familiar with it, what Christ did, not never will you see any mention of anything we do, not something that we must do, that the gospel itself confirms divine election. Every departure from the doctrine of election in to any extent or in any degree has been a departure from the gospel because such a, a departure always involves the introduction of some some obligation on man's part however slight to make a contribution toward his own salvation a contribution that on the one hand he simply can't make and on the other it would just destroy his grace this is unrealistic, folks, with respect to man, and it's dishonoring with respect to God. Look, there are no shades of truth here. I've, I've actually had people say, well, it's a little of both. This is an all or nothing doctrine. Election and the gospel are alike in, in this. There aren't any halfway positions. That, that, that are not a total betrayal of the truth of God. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, is very explicit and completely logical when he says regarding the method by which man is to be saved. If it is by grace, then it, it is no more works. This is what Paul says. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. That's, that's a little ahead of us in our study, Romans chapter 11, verse 6. There simply is no way out of this conundrum, this, this equation. If man contributes anything whatsoever to his salvation, even his own responsiveness of heart, or the exercise of his own faith, then folks, salvation is no longer by grace because it becomes a cooperative effort between man and God in which the decision of man and not the decision of God determines the issue. This is what I've tried so hard to, to explain and I'm not that good at it. Just the mere mention of the words election or predestination today 
it brings to people's minds the name of Calvin, as, as though it all began with Calvin and was an unheard of doctrine before the time of Calvin. I run into this all the time, and nothing could be further from the truth. John's Gospel contains the most explicit statements on the, many of you may not know this, but John contains the most explicit statements found in all of Scripture concerning this subject. Most are unaware of the fact that the Old Testament also bears witness of election. It is, in all truth, the very seed of the gospel itself. We can see evidence in the Old Testament, as well as the New Testament, that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that Calvin was in fact, he was doing nothing more than continuing a very scriptural tradition by his insistence on the absolute sovereignty of God in the matter of, of our salvation. Now, some of you have in fact come to see this truth. I've read your messages, I've read your emails, you've written to me, and some of you have written to me expressing your wonder and amazement over how that you could have been reading the Word of God for so many years without becoming aware of the true nature of its message. I want to direct your attention back to the Old Testament. In the Old Testament, we read, The Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him. Numbers 16, 5. Divine election. I have reserved to myself 7,000 which have not bowed the knee to Baal, 1 Kings 19.18, Divine Election. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, Psalm 65.4, again, Divine Election. Quicken us, revive us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, and we shall be saved. The quickening comes first. Psalm chapter 80, verse 18 and 19. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Psalm 110.3. The preparation of, of the heart in me and you and, and the response, the answer of the tongue is from the Lord, says Proverbs 16.1. Now, folks, this is scripture, and this is Old Testament scripture. Lord, thou will ordain peace for us, for thou have wrought all our works in us. Isaiah 26.12. God did it. God's doing it. O oh Lord, that I know that the way of a man is not in, in himself. It is not in man that walks to direct his steps. Jeremiah 10, 23. What do you do with that verse? Turn thou me. Turn thou me, and I shall be turned, for thou art the Lord my God. Surely after that I was turned, I repented. Jeremiah 31, 18 and 19. Again, we see divine election in the Old Testament. Turn thou us unto thee, O Lord, and we shall be turned. Lamentations 5, 21. So here's my question to you. 
why would the Gospels not reflect the same truth? Why would the epistles not reflect the same truth? Why would all the rest of Scripture not reflect the same truth? When man approaches God in search of salvation in God's way, it is only because he has first been called of God. That is what the text says. The clearest of, of all the Gospels in, in, in this respect is John's, which is preeminently the Gospel of love in most people's eyes. In view of the fact that, that popular opinion holds election to be a, uh, a cold, repugnant doctrine, even the word doctrine is a bad word, ref reflecting the harshness and, and the unfairness of God rather than his love and graciousness, it, many Christians never even look for evidences of election in the Gospel of John. but the doctrine is more firmly established in John than in any one of, of the synoptic Gospels. And it, it is for the most part, this is why I've often told people, you know, begin reading in John, you know, new Christians. They, they're, it's seen in the very words of our Lord himself. Consider just only what our Lord said in John 6. If, if, if you go to chapter 6 of, of John, putting together the words of verses 37, 39, 40, 44, and 65, here's what we have. All that the Father gives me shall come to me, and this is the Father's will who has sent me, that of all whom he has given me, I shall lose nothing. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes on him may have everlasting life. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. Now, Quote those passages to Christians today, and many, many Christians are offended, as if, as if these words were ours, as if these words were our own words, yet the result of these statements made, well, they were made with back long before us with, with such force and with such repetition by our Lord himself, so much that many of his disciples were highly offended, and why not? Why not? These statements simply reduce the disciples' price to zero, because if they were to be saved, it was to be in no sense to their personal credit. So they walked away. Note how interesting it is how Jesus responded to their offense. He reiterated his words in no uncertain terms. Therefore said I unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him of my Father. Now many were humbled by that statement, I'm sure, when it dawned upon him that what what Christ was really saying, what he really meant, but sadly many were not. We are told that from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Verse 66. Folks, there is no doubt about it. The chapters which preceded this bear out the same truth in unmistakable words right from the very beginning of john john chapter one which you have heard me refer to numerous times we are not born again by the will of man 
nor by the will of the flesh, nor by blood relationship, but of God. It is God and God alone who gives us the power to become his children. John 1, 12 and 13. Equally clear is his statement, the Lord's statement in John 15. If you go to John 15, verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you. Oh, but Steve, what about Peter in Acts chapter 2, verse 38 and 39? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit. Keep reading. Don't stop there. Keep reading. Don't stop and become guilty of proof texting in an effort to support a false view or a false narrative. What does he say? For the promise is unto you, the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Call. These words were spoken in the spirit of Numbers, of chapter 16, in Numbers. The Lord will show who are his and who is holy and will cause him to come near unto him. Even him whom he has chosen will he cause to come near unto him. And in the spirit of Jeremiah, chapter 50, verse 20, I will pardon whom I reserve. It is Paul who not merely proclaims the sovereignty of God in this matter of election and unto salvation, but who, who constructs it, who shapes it, formalizes it, that doctrine of election, giving us by revelation most of the light that we have on, on other aspects of God's elective grace. Like, for example, why one is chosen and another is not. Paul will explain that. I've, I've had people mes message me, ask me, Steve, why does he choose another and not one and not another? Which we'll be looking at very soon in our study of this epistle. We're getting into that area. It is Paul who's, who's whole theology of salvation by grace is presented as an equivalent to the gospel itself by showing that if man is saved entirely without making any contribution himself, he must be saved by sovereign grace. That's just the fact of the matter. So for, forget Calvin. If man contributes anything whatsoever, and, and that contribution is essential to his salvation, well, then he is, in the final analysis, he's saved by his contribution. Do you, do you not understand that? If we are saved by any kind of cooperative effort between us and God, no matter how small, no matter how minute, no matter how little that contribution might be, then grace is no longer grace. Romans chapter 11, verse 6. It's no longer grace. It is an all or nothing situation. Calvin was just preaching the gospel. And mainstream Christianity will say, yes, but, and oh, I hate that word, but, Unless it's we unless it's used by the Holy Spirit, man's contribution it, it it could it could be merely that he just decides to respond favorably to the moving of of the Holy Spirit in his heart. You know, others don't, and and they're lost. But this guy he does, and he's saved. The decision is his. Comes down to where he holds the final trump card. His responsiveness is his contribution. 
But Paul is clear on this as well. It would make the salvation of the individual a joint effort, and immediately somebody raises the question. I, I've heard it. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. Why does one man respond and another doesn't? Why? Is there something good in that person that responds as, as opposed to the person in, that doesn't? And what does Paul say? It is not of him that wills, nor of him that runs, but of God who shows mercy, Romans 9, 16. And I realize we're jumping ahead of ourselves here, but I want to introduce this to you, this chapter to you. And, and now I'm scratching my head for the next 30 years trying to figure out what every, I'm trying to figure out why every single pastor and Bible teacher that I've ever just about ever known what they do with that one verse. What do they do with that verse? John says that it is not by the will of man, but by the will of God that we become his children. And James, James, it's, this, is, this isn't just Paul here. James says, of his own will begat he us. James 1.18. And, and so with all that head scratching, I find I don't have as much hair on my head these days. Oh, but Steve, well, what about faith? Okay, all right, this, the same is true of faith. It is not even our faith that saves, but the faith of Jesus Christ is what the text says. Not the faith in Jesus Christ, as some translators would like it to be, or, or have made it to be, or wanted to say. We read in Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 2, verse 16, a man is not justified by the works of the law, but, read it, by the faith of Jesus Christ. And again, in Galatians 3, 22, the scripture has concluded confined all under sin that the promise of the faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. His faith, not ours. So much importance has been attached to the exercise of faith as the basis of, of salvation that this has become our contribution, as though a dead man, as though a dead man could exercise faith in his own resurrection. It's something you hear me speaking a whole lot about. I never once, folks, not once did I ever hear or read of any person in the Bible or outside the Bible granting God permission to raise him or her from the dead. Not once. Why? Because, well, they're dead. Man is not saved by his own faith any more than he's saved by his own decision. The moment that we allow such a thing, then what we do is we give credit to those who have this this ability in distinction from those who do, do not have that ability. You know, and the fortunate ones achieve salvation simply because they're in some way, in some way, they're, they're different in themselves. They would have every right to boast in heaven. But boasting, we know boasting is excluded. Romans Chapter 3, we, we, we covered that. Romans 3, 27. We are saved by grace through faith, and that faith, not of ourselves, it is the gift of God, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. Talked about it that in our Ephesians series of videos. We don't even contribute our own saving faith. It is a gift. And so boasting is excluded with a capital E. 
Otherwise, we have to ask, in, in, in what way do men differ For certainly some respond and some believe, while others do neither and are lost. And we read Paul saying, asking, who makes you to differ from another and what do you have that you didn't receive? Now, if you did receive it, why do you glory as if you had not received it? Amazing. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 7. Now, so folks, of course, we don't come right out. We don't, come, we don't just walk around saying, boy, I was a better person because, you know, I mean, I was receptive and, man, and I had faith. We don't, we don't go around saying that. But secretly, most Christians hold that as the difference between the saved and the unsaved. You know, that, you know, between the, haves and the have-nots. And so modern Christianity from the pulpit, and I'm talking about just about every pulpit across the land, appeals to men on this basis, and the Christian world as a whole actually celebrates it. They celebrate it. And so we proclaim another gospel, which is not a gospel at all, because it assumes a capability in man that he simply doesn't have, and that's what the convert, the new convert, walks away believing. That's what he thinks he has. Is man stronger than God? Well, what a stupid question. But I, I went ahead and asked it anyway. And, and so I, I'm drawn to Paul quoting our Lord's words to Moses, who says, clearly says, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. And we don't like that. We don't like that. The, the human mind does not like that. It resists that. The human spirit, I don't know, whatever is going on up in, in that human brain, it just does not like that. And, of course, now the accusation is, yeah, well, but, Steve, you know, you're, you're making man a puppet. That's another thing I've heard. If I've heard it once, I've heard it hundreds of times. You're, you're, making, you're making us all out to be puppets. So the guy can't possibly be blamed for being lost how could he be blamed if he isn't one of god's elect and again again the holy spirit comes to the rescue again i read paul writing through the inspiration of the holy spirit paul you will say then to me why does he yet find fault for who has resisted his will, Romans chapter 9, verse 19. And what I am suggesting to you, beloved people out there, is that it is human logic making the conclusion that Paul was undermining human responsibility, that the human logic reaches further and, 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 and basically says that, that it says that it, it's essential to restore human responsibility in order to ensure people are saved. You know, and because man likes to feel he is a free agent, and I say, baloney that human reason could discover the truth without revelation, folks, is baloney. That man would ignore what is written and look to their own minds, depraved minds, natural minds, for the answer is baloney. Therefore, Paul was just, well, he's being misunderstood. More baloney. And that, folks, is a lot of baloney. So all along the way, from the beginning, long before Calvin, up to the present, little by little, 
a more humanly reasonable view of, of the way of salvation. Oh, it's, we got to make God like ourselves. I mean, you know, God, should, you know, no, we wouldn't do that. So God, surely he couldn't do that. Man still needs salvation, but it's, it's now seen as something possible with God's help. You know, man cooperating by a certain willingness to acknowledge his need and express his faith. This much of, of human goodness, uh, apparently it, it, there's just a little bit, some, some little spark didn't die. There's, there's a little spark there. It's, he's not completely dead. He's not a completely dead, spiritually dead corpse. In spite of his fallen nature, there's a little bit of good left in him somewhere, and we got to bring that out of him. And we must, we must bring our portion. You know, let us bring what is ours. God will finish the rest, or God will furnish the rest. Sounds great. Year after year, sitting on a, in a church pew, listening to that other gospel message, until by God's grace, we're exposed to the serious nature of the breach of the lie the whole sentimental message sometimes delivered with tears you've seen it all of a sudden it becomes clear a dead man is required to make a contribution towards his own resurrection to life and to that well, I got him Throw in another slice of bologna. Yeah, I hate bologna. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.